Last year, I was working at a German newspaper and I was talking to my colleague about my experiences in Germany. He said to me, Kira, you know, when you talk about Germany, I feel like you're talking about a totally different country. I feel like you're talking not about the country I know. It's not Germany. I had told him a few stories, a few experiences. Just a few weeks before that, I was in the south of Germany and I was eating my salad and a man came up, he was yelling at me, screaming at me, telling me to go back home, wherever that was, and he told me that he hoped that I choked to death. I had also told him the story of those fifth graders in my school um, of different backgrounds, um, Arabs, Afghans, Turks, who were told by their teacher regularly that they wouldn't be able to make it in the school anyways. And they eventually dropped out of school later in those years. They became what that teacher destined them to be. I had also told him the story of that friend of mine who graduated from university. She was a good student who applied for many jobs, but she couldn't get any because she was the Muslim headscarf, she was a hijabi, and eventually she not only took off her hijab, but she also left Germany. So why is it that my colleague couldn't recognize the stories? Why couldn't he recognize Germany? It is because we walk down the same street, but we live in different realities. And that's because we live in bubbles. So we all have our social bubbles. We like to be around people who are just like us, people who have the same educational background, same financial background, um, ethnic background, religious orientation, political interests, um, music taste, the list goes on and on. It's so much easier to be around people who are just like you. This is our comfort zone. I mean, I'm, for me as a Muslim, it's so much easier to be with Muslims I don't have to explain why five times a day I all of a sudden disappear to pray, or I don't have to explain why I wear the Muslim headscarf. So it's okay to be in your social bubble. It's okay to be in your comfort zone. But you have to be aware of the fact that you do live in a social bubble, that you do live in your comfort zone. And from time to time, you have to take the courage and step out of it. That's what I did uh, a few years ago. I was a young journalist, and it was the 1st of May in Hamburg, in my hometown. And neo-Nazis had announced a demonstration. Up until then, I had never seen a neo-Nazi, and I could not really believe they existed. So obviously, as a young journalist, I was going to go interview them. So I went to the demonstration with my young journalist press card, passed by the police barrier, up to the demonstration, to those masses of bald heads. The sun was shining. They were like reflecting the sun. And I looked at them. I looked at them, and I was in shock because I could not believe that in my society it was possible that one person could hate another without knowing that person. That one person could build up his whole world purely on hate. So I was standing there in shock. I ended up smiling, <laughs> waving, and I left. So, whoops. So, this got me thinking. I thought about, why is it that this happens in our society? Why is it that people hate so much? How is that possible? And I thought to myself, it is because we don't meet. We don't have enough spaces in our society in which we encounter the other. So I decided to meet as many people as possible. So whenever I was on a bus, on a train, on a tube, on a plane, I would talk to everyone around me. I would never leave a bus or a plane or a train or a tube without talking to people around me. And wonderful things happened. Some of those people I've met are still my friends. Once I remember, I was talking to a priest on a train, and there was a lady a few rows back. She was a lawyer. She raised her hand. She was like, oh, I've never talked to hijabi before. May I join you? I was like, yeah, come on. <laughs> That's our conversation. But I also realized I can't be on all buses and all trains and all planes and all tubes, so there must be an easier way. And what's easier than a click? So I decided to create digital encounters. In 2008, I created my blog in which I was telling my stories of, on, about how it is to live as a young Muslim in Germany. And I got beautiful responses. I became the first hijabi columnist. I got a letter from a girl who was saying that she never had had the courage to approach a Muslim woman, but through my stories she had an insight into how it is to be a Muslim woman, and she felt more uh, courage to approach a Muslim woman on the street and talk to her. Um, and I also started to tell stories of others, 
of people around me, of other minorities, of people who are silenced, who are not present in mainstream media, of people who have different sexual orientations, different ethnic backgrounds, different religious backgrounds. And this is the internet, so I also got bad responses. One man in particular, he wrote to me, he threatened to kill me, and so, but he was racist, but he wasn't German, he was Russian German, so it took him one and a half pages to explain to me why he was more German than me, <laughs> and the last bit he described how he'd like to kill me. But I wasn't scared, because I knew he didn't hate me, he hated who he thought, who he thought I was. He didn't want to kill me, he wanted to kill what he thought I was representing. And so I kind of understood him. Because I knew if I were in my social bubble only, if I would only be reading certain media outlets, if I would only be reading certain newspapers, I'd probably be hating a certain group of people too. And I'd probably be a hateful person too. That's why it's so important that minorities who are not present in mainstream media strive for ways to be present as humans, not as problems. That's why it's so important that minorities share their stories and create a space for human encounters. So, and they do. I mean, by no means, I'm not the only Muslim journalist, Muslim blogger, uh, by no means the only minority who is present in media. There are so many others, in Germany especially, they speak up for themselves. They are, they created blogs, Facebook, Twitter, social media in general. They created online magazines to share their ideas, to share how it is to live as a Muslim in Germany. And many other minorities do that too. Let me give you one very prominent example. So you might remember a few months ago, we had this awful movie about the Prophet Muhammad and it sparked awful demonstrations around the world against this movie. And Newsweek had a cover story called Muslim Rage, How I Survived It, How We Can End It. Basically about bad and angry Muslims, right? And um, then they put on Twitter, want to discuss our latest cover? Let's hear it with the hashtag Muslim Rage. I don't know what Newsweek expected. They probably expected that people would be like, oh yeah, Muslims are bad and angry. Or Muslims on Twitter saying, oh yeah, this is so um, disgusting and trying to defend themselves and being bad and angry but they definitely did not expect what happened next. This is an alteration of the cover, and she's, the artist Sabina England made it into a punk concert. <laughs> <laughs> and Muslims on Twitter hijacked the hashtag Muslim Rage. Lost your kid jihad at the airport? Can't yell for him. <laughs> The 72 virgins turn out to be all male. <laughs> uh, hijabi said, I'm having such a good hair day and no one even knows. <laughs> and that's the reason how we do it. <laughs> no Wi-Fi in the mosque. So what happened here? These stories were not, these tweets were not just tweets, they were stories. Through these tweets, those masses of angry and bad Muslims all of a sudden became individuals who you could identify with. Those people who were sending those tweets, they could be your neighbors, your friends, they could be you. So through these little stories, they had the space in which you could meet, encounter, and start to see the human in each other. And I discovered the power of stories when that man who threatened to kill me wrote to me again. He apologized. So I just recently got married, and in Turkey, where I'm originally from, we have this tradition, when a man asks for the hand of a woman in, in marriage, she, uh, he goes to her family, she serves coffee to everyone with sugar, he gets coffee with salt. <laughs> and to prove his love, he has to drink that coffee without making a face. <laughs> And that's what my husband did. And there are many legends and love stories behind this tradition. In my column, I then had shared my favorite legend, my favorite love story behind this tradition. And that man said to me, or wrote to me, he said, you know, I apologize. I, I might have scared you. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, 
You know, when I read your story, I realized you're just a human being. Well, I could have known that before. <laughs> but something interesting had happened here. Through this story, that was not a political story. I wasn't accusing someone, I wasn't defending someone. I was simply telling a story. We had managed to connect. Through this story, we had this safe, shared space in which we could look beyond prejudices, look into, in, inside our hearts, see the human in each other. And that's where the power comes from. So, don't forget, share your stories, keep listening, and see the human. <laughs>